Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achin. As you all can see, I have with me Major General Harsha Kakkar, who's going to take us through a little bit of a observation, uh, which we all can see in terms of a change and a shift of Indian diplomacy. It's not just concerning China; it is concerning a lot of things, and that's something that we can see with the current events in Ukraine as well. A lot of worldwide focus is actually coming onto Indian diplomacy. So, thank you, sir, for joining me and uh, taking us through a little bit of a, you know, background as to what you see in front of us today. Not a problem. My pleasure, totally. Thank you, sir. So, the recent. I'll, let me begin with China before we, you know, jump into Ukraine situation. We've uh, rarely seen a lot of condemnation coming from Indian diplomats about China and uh, the direct naming of China along with its steps and this and that. Uh, we heard E.M. Jay Shankar's statement in the Quad meeting in Melbourne. After that, the Munich uh, Security Conference. Uh, there were a lot of direct attacks that was actually done, which is unlike India's style. How do you see that entire thing, sir? This is the growing confidence of India, the confidence that it can stem the Chinese, whether it's hybrid warfare, whether it is any misadventures. Whether it is an offensive, it's a fact that India is now confident enough to stall China. And as you have seen in large parts of the world, uh, we are also now using information warfare to hit back, and we are using it to tell the world that China is a nation that cannot be trusted. China is a nation that cannot be depended on. It doesn't adhere to agreements. It doesn't uh, adhere to the rules-based order. So therefore, China should be uh, pushed as far as it can by the global community, and we are now compelling China to defend itself. Something which was always in the reverse direction, as far as India was concerned, and this you've been able to do because you've got the confidence of being able to beat back China, not being bullied down by China anymore, whether it's economic, whether it's military, whether it's international. So this is a change that we are seeing in India, a change in the Indian leadership, and a change in the manner in which they want to confront those who they feel are against the nation. How do you think? What What do you think kind of brought in this change from probably three months before to now, and uh, how do you think that the understanding of this change is going to be perceived across the world, sir? Firstly, uh, I mean, with the support of the international community, mainly the Quad with Western nations, also focused towards the Indo-Pacific. Now that Ukraine has changed things a little bit, mm -hmm. but the fact remains that nobody is going to let China get away. Uh, the other fact is that the world has also realized that China is no longer a nation which can be depended on. If you look at the way the uh, Chinese diplomacy collapsed during the Beijing Olympics. There were just about 24 representatives only of those countries, apart from Russia, who were totally dependent on China, and uh, one or two global community members like the IOC chief and the WHO chief. Uh, so beyond that, there was nothing much. So it was literally a collapse of diplomacy, and uh, India saw that opportunity. We also saw the way. I mean, this actually proves the way the world looks at China. So when you look at that. You automatically gain the confidence that yes, you can stand up to it, and plus the fact that we militarily stood up to it for the last two years, we haven't let them budge. There have been incidents, but in all those cases, you've been able to push them back, and they also now are chary that they know that they can't push forward much more, because the moment they try, they're going to get it back. So for that reason, that sort of confidence that you're not going to surrender to the Chinese, you're not going to give up anything to the Chinese. Uh, gives the government confidence to deal with it, and our economy has rebounded back. Mm. So we are moving forward. Plus, internally within China, there is turmoil. Its companies are failing. Something which doesn't come out much. Uh, its small businesses, which actually indicate the growth of the Chinese economy, are no longer there. Uh, the fact that they had to use. Uh, Galwan, uh, 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 an individual who was nominated as a hero for the Galwan clashes, as a torchbearer, displayed that the country is trying desperately to build nationalism in a failing economy, in a failing promise, which is what the communist government gave to the people. 
you surrender your rights and we will give you a good life but today you surrendered your rights but you're not getting a good life what you're seeing is failure mm. so that sort of an unrest within china is pushing china down is pushing china further back within itself and while we are growing and they are moving back so you are in a position to now display your power your recent events in ukraine also put china in a you know very nasty position so getting on to ukraine you know we saw a lot of diplomacy kind of happening around indian leadership and uh, uh, you know calls flying around and if you compare the position of the chinese which were largely connected to the russians but and if you look at the position of indian uh, the indian uh, side you found that it was talking to both the sides and there was a lot of confidence being exuded by uh, both the sides of the game uh, even including the european union how do you see uh, india creating an opportunity for itself within this crisis sir see india has always followed the rule based order it's always supported nations when in trouble it has never interfered in another nation's internal matters despite other nations commenting on india's internal matters the case of canada and the farmers agitation and the truckers agitation in canada by merit so india is respected globally for what it is for what it follows it did not support the russians in the in their invasion it did not uh in the sense uh, accuse ukraine or back to ukraine by saying that you are right and the russians are wrong it took a neutral path it stuck to its uh, policy of rule based order it stuck to its policy of uh, territorial integrity of nations so it was in a large way correct but it refused to take sides now by not taking sides itself is a fact that you are supporting both which is why the ukrainian president called pm modi which is why vladimir putin and russia supported india which is what even the western world understood and for india you've got to realize that when some things happened in galwan or it happened in kargil in 99 the world didn't comment on the way it's commenting now because what happened then and what happened in kargil and in galwan was in a corner of asia <clears throat> it was not in central europe so had it been in central europe the world would have jumped but the fact is that it happened in a corner of asia and it happened to a country which would stand on its own was a nuclear power could not be pushed beyond limits so the world kept quiet but then that is a difference and that was also rules based order that was also uh, taking another territory which had equal value what's happening now it may not have been at the same level but yes it does have value mm. so there is a difference but the fact that even then india stood on its own and it pushed back and it got back what it wanted to all on its own without any help from anyone and india never interfered so india is following a neutral path following a path like now at the moment ukraine needs support so india is providing it with humanitarian support in terms of medicine and possibly even uh, whatever else in terms of food stocks but not arms and ammunition so you are there to stand by when required and that is what the world values that's an uh, i think an interesting step that has been taken by india so a lot of people are viewing the positioning of uh, our senior ministers around ukraine as indian efforts towards kind of bring a mediation or bring about certain amount of peace apart from coordination of rescuing indian citizens from there uh, i'll keep the rescue on a back burner right now but do you see any possibility of india kind of becoming a mediator between um, not ukraine and russia but i think the west and uh, the russia to kind of ease off the tensions in the region uh, i doubt it because india doesn't want to poke its nose when not required mm -hmm. talks when they come will come directly between them India I mean PM Modi is not Imran Khan who goes and offers his mediation expertise everywhere even if not required so there is a world of a difference between a mature leader and an immature leader so India is not going to poke its nose nor did India mention mediation when Ukraine or Vladimir Putin 
when the Ukrainian president of Vladimir Putin spoke to Modi. So India is not going to be involved in it. We are basically sending them down to coordinate efforts for Operation Ganga. We are not sending them down to try and mediate or to find a way through. The Western nation is capable enough. Russia is capable enough. There is still contact between them. The embassies remain in place. The ambassadors are there in both the countries. So if they have to interact, they've got means of interacting. Mm. There is no need for India to go and poke its nose for no reason. It doesn't have a long nose anyway, but it doesn't need to go and poke its nose. So it's staying off. And I think that's the most sensible way of functioning. You mentioned Operation Ganga, sir. We, you know, India has actually, and this is being acknowledged in the West, that India is the only country which has a conceited effort in terms of uh, pulling out his, its own citizens from this war-torn region. And uh, India has now offered help to all countries that are willing to take any help from India in terms of the neighborhood. Um, how do you put this across, saying the factor that the West had actually long refused that we will not be able to do anything for anybody stuck in Ukraine itself? Um, there is a lot of effort, and which is being acknowledged by both the Russians and the Ukrainians. Yes, a few issues on the Polish border as was re reported. That will happen during a war zone. But how do you see the entire effort as the sole country leading such a big effort? See, the problem is that I mean, you're putting in the effort to pull people out. But people who are stuck inside also need to understand that it's not the first time. See, we've, we've had about, historically, almost about 40 missions, or close to 40 missions in which we pulled people out. The biggest was Iraq, was Kuwait. Okay, subsequently, the recent one uh, was one day Matram when we pulled them out during COVID, when we pulled out people from Middle East during COVID. Now, when people were told, you must leave, they refused to listen. Just because Ukraine said there's unlikely to be a war. At the moment the first bullet is fired, you say, pull us out. It's not easy to coordinate in a war zone. Mm. Now, you have to move. People have to move out of the war zone on their own. They can't be hand-led out of the war zone. Because you didn't follow the directions which came earlier. Now, for the nation to coordinate, after all, it's at an immense cost. Flights are moving in, picking up people. One way is empty. The other way, you're picking up people, getting them out. <coughs> getting them to safety, you're coordinating with the nation's concern. You're working, I mean, with uh, not only the nation, you're also working with organizations within the nation to care for the individuals who are coming into the country before they can be lifted out. Now, there are, there are huge borders. People land up at different crossing places, depending on the city that they are in. Now, from those crossing places, they have to be transported to the place from where they've got to be picked up. It's a huge logistical exercise. And you've got to coordinate with the uh, border people across the region. So the government, no matter how much it tries, there will always be shortfalls. Absolutely. There will always be some levels where people, where the local uh, security guys or the border guards may not listen, may not get the right directions, may have different perspectives. So these are things that happen. But the fact is that you launch the mission and it's not going to be a short one. It's at least going to take a month before you're able to pull everyone out. And you're going to, after all, the flights don't come easy. They're all private airlines. You also privatized Air India. So all private airlines, you've got to pay the cost of fuel. You've got to pay the cost of using the aircraft. You've got to pay everything to pull the people out. So that's got to be done. Now, to ensure that you maximize the effort is why the minister is important. You cannot have an aircraft taking off at 15, 20 on board. If you're planning to pull them out and you've got to maximize the effort, you've got to move in full aircraft loads. Mm. Now, that is where you need to coordinate. And, you, and until you get the aircraft load, you've got to house the people, you've got to keep them, you've got to care for them. So that is where things come in. If you realize that the prime minister has gone and tapped organizations like the Art of Living and the rest of them, which are in all Western European countries. That we want your people, your organizations, to help our people as they get out of Ukraine, to house them, care for them, and look after them till the time we can fly them out. Mm. Now, I mean, that is the level to which the government is gone. And luckily for us, the Indian diaspora, wherever it is, is a close-knit community. 
they're always willing to support their own. I've had massive experiences of the hospitality of the Indian diaspora in Canada. <clears throat> but it's a fact that they're always willing to help. Now, that is also a community that you're tapping through. Now, if you're going to do all this locally, you need to have someone with power who's based there. Now, the ministers who are there, they're going to be coordinating with governments to pass directions to the border crossings, coordinating with these organizations to care for them till they get plane loads, then coordinating the airlifting out. So all that, and you've got to remember that most of the youngsters who are there don't have visas for the country into which they're crossing. <laughs> So you've got to handle that part also. So or that is why you need a responsible government uh, emissaries in these countries. That is absolutely true. And the way things are actually happening, it seems like it's gonna we, we're going to be able to pull it off in a similar fashion that Rahat was done from uh, uh, Yemen at that time. Uh, so just another thing about uh, the requirement of diplomacy during Ukraine, it actually shows us the a requirement for Atman Nirvata more than anything else actually today because, um, you know, with having that sort of a, you know, uh, direction, it is much more simpler for India to actually take a very, very independent stand. Uh, even today, when we take a stand, it is questioned across and uh, there might be repercussions for these particular stands that we are taking. Uh, how do you think this whole concept is going to come out as a as a stern requirement for India going forward, sir. See, it is easy to say that we need to get Atmanirbhar Bharat. Yes, that is there for the future. But you've got to remember that an equipment once introduced into service stays in service for 30, 40 years. Yeah. Now, what about the equipment that was introduced 10, 15, 20 years back? That is still in service. You may be able to do maintenance in India, but you still have to import spare parts. Spare parts. Okay, so that is where the game comes. Why do you think when companies want to sell equipment, they're willing to do anything to get the equipment accepted? Because they know for the next 40 years, you're stuck. So whether it's aircraft, whether it's ships, whether it's land-based uh, tanks, I mean, everything is banking on spare parts coming in from the uh, original equipment manufacturer. Yes, for the future, you can do it. <clears throat> but you've got to realize that this process is going to take 15, 20 years. Hmm. So you're starting now, but you're going to continue. And so ultimately, you may be able to create a reasonable level of Atman Nirbhar Bharat or self-reliance uh, and self-production in about two decades from now. But the fact is that till then, the equipment that's with you is going to continue. And, and all the time, you're going to be, uh, I mean, you're the control to some extent is with the country which supplied you the equipment. So that is something you need to be careful about. And uh, that has some impact. Not very much, though, because there are means, there are ways and means of bypassing it. But then that impact will remain. And uh, then you only take equipment from countries with whom you have good relations. You don't take equipment from anyone with whom the relations can collapse in a short time. So you've done that. You assess from where you're getting it. And you picked it up. But now you have to maintain that network to ensure that everything remains in place. So coming to the, you know, uh, one thing that I personally feel there is a big gap in terms of diplomacy. And this is something that I wanted to keep towards the end, not because of the gap part, but it's a very important thing with regards to our own neighborhood. And that's somewhere we find ourselves slipping. Um, the issues in Myanmar, we've got a huge issue happening in Nepal with massive protests last week. Um, Sri Lanka, which is down in an economic crisis. Uh, you've got Bangladesh, which is teetering, you know, uh, tr we try and pull it back from Chinese clutches and then it goes back and it pulls back. It's sort of a tug of war and nothing. I don't have much to say about Pakistan that uh, people don't know about. So there's a huge challenge within our neighborhood. Uh, do you think we are effectively kind of addressing it at the moment? And if not, what do you think we should do? See, as far as the nations are concerned in the neighborhood, they will always play both sides. That's a fact. Because China gives them offers, India gives them offers. So it's best to exploit both sides. But the fact is that you can give that much that you can afford. 
you cannot yes. go beyond a certain point now when sri lanka was in, when maldives was in a jam we helped them out with whatever we could sri lanka is in a jam today <coughs> we are helping them out we have supported nepal uh, we are supporting bangladesh in ways that we can the fact is that there will always be elements within a country which are against you there are elements now in in maldives with the old uh, president now released and uh, the and india get out uh, sort of calls are coming out in sri lanka you have a lobby which is anti india you got a lobby in nepal you got a lobby in bangladesh myanmar india has relations with the with the military junta the other nations imposed uh, <clears throat> sanctions on them but india did not and india still maintains ties we still providing support so that is a sort of the network that you can give within what you have but the fact remains that these nations know that india does not interfere that is a major difference india does not demand a certain amount of binding in return with china india does not give loans to get something back in return so that way you find that the indian relationship is good but every country needs the more funds that it gets it possibly displays that you know it is doing more for the population especially in their democracies but then the long term impact is different now with india the funds that are given are not intended to gain back something in terms of country's policies so india relationship is good you can always say that we need to do much more but then you can only do that much that you can afford hmm. that is true sir there there is always a limit uh, to this whole thing and i actually agree with the first part that you mentioned that the the nations will try their best and play both the sides because at the end of it every nation is going to look towards its own national interest and there is nothing that is uh, if they are able to actually swindle both sides and get something out of it well you know fair enough and uh, nobody can blame them for that so thanks so much this has been a you know nice short crisp discussion about indian diplomacy and where do we see ourselves headed back i agree with you completely in terms of uh, the reasoning that you've put across with regards change of indian diplomacy against china i think it needs to get a bit more stronger and this is something that you and i have also spoken and this this is a realization which is happening uh, throughout the strategic community and i hope within the leadership of the country as well to kind of move forward and take steps in the interest of india i think uh, you know somebody had mentioned on my channel we don't need to be anti china but we need to be pro india so at that note thank you so much sir till next time for another subject another day jai hind jai hind thank you and thank you take care thank you sir bye bye okay bye